ಪೃಥಿವೀಶಾಂತಿರಂತರಿಕ್ಷಗಂ ಶಾಂತೈರ್ಯಶಾಂತೈರ್ದಿಶಾಂತಿರವಾಂತರ ದಿಶಾಶಾಂತಿರಗ್ನಿಶಾಂತೈರ್ ವಾಯುಶಾಂತಿರಾದಿತ್ಯಶಾಂತಿ ಚಂದ್ರಮಾಶಾಂತೈರ್ನಕ್ಷತ್ರಾಶಾಂತಿರಾಪ ಶಾಂತಿರೋಷದಯ ಶಾಂತೈರ್ ವನಸ್ಪತಯ ಶಾಂತೈರ್ ಗೌಶಾಂತಿರಾಂತಿರಶ್ವಶಾಂತಿ ಪುರುಷಾಂತೈರ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಶಾಂತೈರ್ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರೇವ ಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರ್ಮೇ ಅಸ್ತು ಶಾಂತಿ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಆನ್ ಅರ್ಥ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸ್ಕಾಯ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ವಾಟರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಡಿರೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪ್ಲಾಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಟ್ರೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆ್ಯನಿಮಲ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ದೇ ಬಿ ಪೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಸುಖಿನ ಸೇ ಸು ನಿರಾಮೇ ಭದ್ರಿ ಪಶ್ಯಂತ ಮಾ ಕಶ್ಚಿತ್ತು ದುರ್ಗಾಣಿ ಪಶ್ಯತು ಸದ್ಬುಧಿಮಾಪ್ನೋತು ಸರ್ವತ್ರ ನಂದತು ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೆಲ್ತಿ ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಸಿ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗುಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೇ ನೋ ಒನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಮೇಸರಿ ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಓವರ್ಕಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಆಬ್ಸ್ಟಿಕಲ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಕ್ವಾಯ ಯೋರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಟೆಂಡೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಮೇ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಎವ್ರಿವೇರ್ ಫೈನ್ ಜಾಯ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫುಲ್ಫಿಲ್ಮೆಂಟ್ let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in every one the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
सतो मा सत्कमया तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमया आवीरावीर्मेती रुद्रय ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मं May the divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality with the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us So now we take a section of the text in which Narada will again describe the characteristics of love or bhakti. So Sutra fifty one, it's on page one thirty seven. Anirvachaniyam, prema swarupam. The nature of supreme love is beyond description. Now anirvachaniyam, we find this word occurs in um, in Vedanta texts in many different contexts. In some sense, every experience is indescribable. Let let me explain. First of all, there are there are there are two kinds of experiences. One is a cognitive experience; the other is an affective experience. Um, For instance, when we have these um, reporters, sometimes giving a live commentary of what they are saying, or reporting, sometimes when you hear the world news on BBC, so there is an actual reporter out in the field, and uh, who is reporting what he or she is seeing. Now, that is cognitive experience they are seeing something and then they are reporting that this is what i am seeing so something that is an object of one's cognition but let's say as a result of seeing something the reporter is personally affected by it um it let's say there is some you are out there in some relief camp and seeing the terrible condition of the people suffering there the reporter is affected now how would the reporter report on how it has affected him or her that is not so easy to do it's easy to report oh this camp is so big there are so many people and this is the condition so that's the reporting of, or expressing of a cognitive experience as to be distinguished from reporting or expressing an affective experience i mean we can use words we can say or oh, i'm very much moved or i'm i am devastated when we have words in in a language to describe our what's happening within us but that that gives us some idea but i think very little idea i mean you can hear 10 different people saying i am devastated okay but you know what is exactly happening as a result of the devastation that's something that cannot be put into words if that is the case with with um, experiences in day to day lives it's much more so in the case of bhakti so bhakti is anirvachaniya or inexpressible or beyond description because the experience of god's love that god loves me and i love god is not a cognitive experience it is something that cannot be reported as easily or cannot be described as easily 
as an affective experience. So it's something that is happening completely internally. And that's why it is anirvachaniyam. And that's why you will see. That's why sometimes it's easier to speak and discuss and argue about, about, um, about philosophy, about, about things that deal with cognition. Why this is like this? Why this is not like that? It's not always easy to, to discuss and talk about love because it is completely internal. And the books and, and songs and hymns try their best to convey that, that, that mood, the idea, the, but still it still falls short of what is exactly experienced in the deep heart. And that is why um, it is always said that um, once we experience that love for God in the heart, we will never doubt it and nobody else will ever be able to, to, to shake uh, the reality of that love. Intellectual understanding sometimes can be, can be shaken. So you have reasoned out some truth in one way, and someone with a better power of reasoning can apply a different kind of logic and kind of shake your thing. You said, whoa, was I, was I thinking this thing through correctly? Because the other point of view seems better. So there is sometimes a, a, a possibility of, of our convictions when they are not strong enough to be shaken. But the experience of love, if it is, if it is a real experience, because sometimes we, a momentary feeling of exuberance or a momentary thing can be sometimes mistaken, then those things kind of pass away without leaving any deep impression on the heart. But that even a glimpse of that real love when it is experienced in the heart, uh, you may not be able to express it, but nobody will be able to, to, to shake you out of it. That's the interiority of love. And that is what he described here, that the nature of supreme love is beyond description. It's real, but it cannot be described. Because even unreal things sometimes are beyond description. So that's the thing. It is very real. In fact, it is so real that all words fall short of describing God's love for us and the love of a devotee for God. And the example is given in the next sutra, 52. Muka Swadhanavat. Which means, it is like the experience of a dumb person. Again, a dumb person won't be able to even put it into words. The rest of us who are not, well, dumb in, in a literal sense here. Even us, all experience, again, as I said, even if you eat a delicious dish and someone asks, how is it? Well, you are going to use word. You can say, oh, it's very tasty. It's delicious. But still, that description comes nowhere close to what you have exactly experienced. Again, it is so much more true with the experience of love in the heart. Oftentimes, the presence of love does not have to be, doesn't even need to be expressed. Um, it gets expressed on its own. If there is love in the heart, it will show itself in just the way a person looks, the way the person talks, the way a person deals. You can see if, if two people are in, in truly in love with each other, it's not necessary to go on reassuring each other, oh, I love you, I love you. I mean, although that's kind of become a part of our culture, it's not necessary. In fact, to, to say it is to say, oh, in case you have forgotten, I love you, or don't ever doubt it. But when there is real love, it's no need to even say it, because just, just uh, the way two people in love will look at each other, that is enough. So uh, expression is not even necessary. And if that is the thing, even with love between two human beings, it's much more so 
the love between a devotee and God. That's why someone who truly loves God doesn't have to go around trying to establish one's credentials of a devotee. Oh, I'm a good, say, I'm a devotee. Sometimes we see people saying, I'm a devotee, I've been coming to the Vedanta Center last 30 years. That, that doesn't mean anything. You could be coming for the last 200 years. It's not, it's not about how long I have been reading some book or how long I have been meditating. It's not about that at all. It's about, is there true love in my heart or the ideal? And if it is there, um, sooner or later, it will somehow, in spite of myself, um, exude through my personality, through the way I sit, through the way I pray, through the way I deal with other people. It, I don't have to go out of my way to show how much I love God. It, if it is there, it will automatically show itself. In fact, um, I like the, the uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk. He was um, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in the 60s. And the great work he and his uh, fellow monks did in the, during the, the fallout of the Vietnam War. And um, speaking about him, I think it was Thomas Merton who wrote, and it was a simple sentence. He said that seeing the way he enters a room and closes the door behind him, I know he's a true monk. Now you might say, what's, what's a big deal about entering a room and closing a door behind you? Now, that is what I meant, that whatever we are inside, We, we, it, it will show itself outside. Mm. And so none of us should be too sure that what I am inside, the inner person, is, is, is known only to me. And, all, and to some extent it's true. To some extent what my, my family, my friends, and the circles in which I move, what they see is the is the exterior, the mask that I have, my physical appearance, and, and the way I, I, I speak, the way I deal with people, the way I do my work. And if I'm careful to, to, to pay attention to these exteriors, that's what the rest of the world is going to take me to be. And that's why sometimes you see, um, um, even, even with this mass shootings and things that, that unfortunately seem to occur with, with, with greater frequency nowadays. And then later on you'll find sometimes people who knew the person who did it and say, oh, this person, we never thought this person is like that. This person seemed like many people are shocked. Well, some people say, well, it was expected, but, but some others are shocked by it because they saw one side of that person, the ex externalities of the person, and not the real person. So as they say, it's possible to fool some of the people all of the time, all of the people some of the time. You cannot fool all the people all the time. And so sooner or later, what we are inside will be revealed to the world outside. Because just not possible for anyone to, to always maintain that mask all the time. People whom we meet periodic, okay, occasionally, it's possible probably to say, to kind of show a different side of our personality. But especially people we are living with, our own family or even those who are very close to us, they often know it better. Than, than people we don't meet that often. And that's why it is sometimes said that those who are close to you, those who know you well, if they think you are a good person, then you are probably a really a good person. Because, because people we meet occasionally, um, it's, it's not, there's not enough time. It's easy to, 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 to 
put on a persona. So to this thing. And that's why sometimes all these public figures that we have who meet, whom, whom, whose only public persona we know, and sometimes people are shocked to see how they behaved in private. Now, bhakti, all this I mentioned to show that if there is true love in the heart, that will show itself without us having to make any extra effort about it. Um, that is the idea. So, Mukha Swadhanavat. Next, Sutra 53. <coughs> Prakashate kvapi patre. It, the prema, that is love for God, manifests itself in the heart of a worthy seeker. So although love for God is ineffable, inexpressible, as the earlier sutra said, it does manifest itself in kva means in some places and patre means in some people. So it is inexpressible, but we can see it in some places and in some people. And that's what it translated here as in a worthy seeker. Now the characteristics of a person in whom this love manifests itself have been dis discussed earlier, which we have seen many of those aphorisms of how this love manifests in people. Now in Narada, um, in the, there is another one big book called the Bhagavata, in which Narada describes how the supreme love manifested itself in his own life. It's a beautiful Sanskrit verse. Uh, let me read the Sanskrit first, just so that you can hear the, the sound of it, and then I will read the translation. The, the, the verse goes like this. Dhyayata charanam bhojam bhava nirjita chetasa autkanthya shrukulakshasya Ridi asin me shanair harihi. Premati bhara nirbhinnam. Pulakangoti nirvrataha. Ananda samplave lino. Na pasyam ubayam mune. And what Narada is saying is this how that love transformed him, how that love entered into his own life. Slowly, Lord Hari, that's how Vishnu is often characterized in books, entered my heart when I was meditating upon the lotus feet of the Lord with a mind made calm by devotion, with my eyes filled with the tears of longing and with my body thrilled owing to exuberance of love. Then, immersed in the ocean of ecstatic love, I did not notice either of us, that is either me or God. <coughs> Very important. Sometimes we think about <coughs> non-dualism as, as a something to do with only with knowledge, the path of Jnana Yoga. And what Swami Vivekananda emphasizes in the description of all of his four yogas is that through all of these yogas, you ultimately reach that same state of oneness. And that is what he described here. When we begin any devotional act, whether it's in the form of prayer, worship, or meditation, in the beginning, there is this distance. I am aware that I am the one who is praying and I am praying to God. Or I am the one who is worshipping and here is, if you are doing a ritualistic worship, here is the Lord in front of you on the altar, in a deity, in a, in a picture or in an image or whichever way you worship. If you are meditating, well I am meditating and I am meditating in God in my heart. So that, that distinction between me, the one who is praying, the one who is worshipping, the one who is meditating from God is very clear. But oftentimes, once that prayer or worship or meditation becomes a little bit deeper, you are no longer aware of that now. If, if you are praying and if every moment you are thinking, I am the one who is praying, I am the one who is praying, then it's no prayer. <clears throat> so one, very soon, once that action begins, whether of prayer, worship or meditation, the idea that I am the one who is doing it, it completely goes away. If that prayer and worship and meditation are truly the way they ought to be, then in my field of consciousness, in my heart, it is just the object of my love. Whichever way I think of the divine. So the divine alone remains. 
So when I'm praying to God, I mean, think about it this way. Even when you, even when you speak with someone over the phone, when you pick up the phone, you are aware. Well, you are the one who is picking up the phone, and you are calling someone. But when you are actually carrying on a conversation, every moment you are not thinking. I am the one who is speaking. Clearly, you're, all that you are thinking about the person you are speaking to. So exactly in the same way, when prayer, worship, and meditation, when you have launched into that activity, provided you are not distracted by anything else, then God alone remains the object of your prayer, worship, or meditation. And when that absorption becomes deeper still, then even that distinction goes away. Then that's what he means here by saying, I did not notice either of us, either myself or God. That is, when you'll be so immersed in that experience of that love itself, then even this idea, this is God or this is me, that completely goes away. And only that love remains. That is how love entered into Narada's life. That's what he's describing here. And our <clears throat> history is filled, filled with people in whose heart this love for God manifested. And this is true in every tradition, in every tradition, in every point in history, in every generation. So there have been great bhaktas, or, although the word bhakti may not be used in every tradition, obviously, but, but this idea of the seeker whose heart is filled with love, you'll find great exemplars, great models who, whose lives are so inspiring in Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them. Even Buddhism, there are, because sometimes, again, um, Theologically, sometimes Buddhists are seeing like, well, they don't believe in God. Or there is no place for the God as we understand it in Buddhism. But the, there are Buddhists who love the Buddha in, with the same intensity of love and surrender that a Hindu may have or a, or a Muslim may have or a Christian may have. So that love itself, that, that experience of love, that experience doesn't change. When you go to the particularities, how a prayer is done in one tradition or how a worship is done, or how meditation, those expression of those practices may be different. The language may be different. The rituals may be different. The way the divine is th conceived of may be different. But all of these differences simply vanish with that experience of love. And that is what Narada is describing here. That although love is ineffable, it is expressed, it is seen, it is manifested in some places and in some people. And the hope and the ideal is that those of us who, for whom this path becomes meaningful or relevant in our own lives, our aspiration then is that may, through God's grace, may I be one of those people whose life that love of God is experienced or gets manifested. <coughs> Sutra 54. <coughs> Guna rahitam, kamana rahitam, pratikshana vardhamanam, avichinnam, sukshmataram, anubhava rupam. And the love of God, or prema, is without attributes, without any desire, and goes on increasing every moment. It is unbroken inner experience, subtler than the subtlest. So you have several now adjectives here describing what the nature of that love is. Guna <clears throat> rahitam, literally translated means it is indefinable because it transcends the gunas. Everything in the nature, as we have seen, uh, manifests through these three basic gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas. Um, but the experience of love transcends all of these three. Because it transcends all of these three, 
That is why it is inexpressible. <coughs> Next is Kamana Rahitam, which means it is um, beyond all desires or bereft of all desires. Now we have already seen um, in, in the example how um, a person who, who experienced something is not able to exp uh, express it in that example of the, of the dumb person eating it. In the Kamana Rahitam means that the joy that is experienced as a result of love for God is not the result of a fulfillment of a desire. Although sometimes we do express that longing for God <clears throat> as if it's a desire. Mm. Although the word used is often same sometimes, but the desire for God is qualitatively uh, a different kind of desire, if we must use the word desire in relation to God. <coughs> The reason is this, that yes, when our desire is fulfilled, it makes us, it makes us happy. But the problem with, with desire is that um, the, the, the experience of fulfillment um, remains for a while. We know that no happiness we get from things that we love, that we experience in this world, from any kind of an world entity in this in this world, um, the experience doesn't remain forever. You see, I mean, if you love chocolate ice cream, let's say, and sometimes just seeing that ice cream itself will make you happy, and when you start eating, it will make you even more happy. And let's say you have had one, and then so that as long as that ice cream remains on your tongue and you're still tasting it, you are in bliss. Um, afterwards, uh, that, that taste might linger for a little while more and you are still happy. Um, but after some time, maybe after half an hour or one hour or something, you're going to say, okay, so that taste is gone. Um, and if, if, if your doctor has told you you shouldn't be eating it and if you have already eaten it, then that joy quickly gets transformed into even anxiety. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have had it. Anyway, the idea is that that joy doesn't last forever. And then the only way we can um, prolong it, so to speak, is to, is to repeat the experience. They have more ice cream, and then you have more ice cream. But there is a limit to how much you can eat it in one sitting. So after some time, um, you're just going to say, no matter how much you like something, after some time you say, okay, no more. I just can't take any more. Maybe next day it might be different. But in one sitting, after some time you're just going to get, you're going to, there is a kind of a, a satiety will enter inside. That doesn't happen with bhakti. That is why it is called kamana rahitam. It's beyond desire. If <clears throat> love for God was a fulfillment of a desire for God, then, of course, it'll, it's making me happy. When I'm love, I'm just, my heart is filled with joy. But then, it would have disappeared after a while. That doesn't happen. Or, if too much of love for God enters, it's going to say, okay, now, because a lot of the pleasures that we have in life, after some time, become kind of stagnant. Or kind of, they peak up to a point, and then it just kind of remains steady. If not, they may even diminish. But love for God, that doesn't happen that way. That's why it's considered not to be a, a, a result of, of uh, a desire. And which is why the next adjective, pratikshana vardhamanam, that is ever increasing. So contrary to what happens with the fulfillment of desires in our day-to-day -day lives, this love for God 
actually it increases every moment. Now this can mean one of two things or both. One is that bhakti or love for God is an ever fresh experience. It's, it's a constantly um, renewing itself. So it's not like, oh, I, I feel such great love for God and now oh, I'm just tired of loving God. That, if that love is real, you will never feel that way. In fact, it's not as if, oh yes, I, I, I love God and now it's kind of become, that I'm just, it's become a little boring, or it's become stale. That never happens. So love for God always remains fresh. That is one meaning of that phrase, pratikshana vardhamanam. It can also mean it steadily increases, that there is no limit. No one can say that the limit is reached. And yet, it is something that, that because we, many of us have never had a taste of it, the best that many of us then try to do is, uh, is try to find happiness in, in fulfillment of desires in our day-to-day -day life. But a lot of these, these desires, in fact, take away, take my mind away from God. And one of the reasons desires kind of get demonized in religious literature is not because the desires themselves are bad in itself, but if the goal of my life is to connect with that transcendent reality, then everything that keeps me distracted from that reality is seen as an obstacle. <clears throat> so there may be nothing intrinsically wrong or bad about eating ice cream, but, but if all of my joy exists only in ice cream, then I will, not, I will remain either ignorant or I will remain um, indifferent to other kind of joys in life which are more lasting. That's the idea. That's the idea that is being expressed here. Then uh, avichinnam. Avichinnam means it is, it is unbroken. Now that is, that is again an experience uh, as I just referred to earlier while giving the example of, of the ice cream. That all of the, the joys that we have in life, none of them are continuous. All of them have a break. All of them begin and end. And then you begin and end, begin and end. But, but there is no unbroken experience. That experience can come only from love of God. Which is why the important point here is that love for God, my love for God and God's love for me is not something that begins at certain point of time. So sometimes we might think, oh, I never feel any love for God in my heart or I don't know whether God loves me. And then maybe something changes in my life and say, oh, now, five years ago, I never had that love. Now I feel I love God. So sometimes we have these kind of moments. We feel like that. What is important to remember here is that the devotee's love for God and God's love for the devotee, that love is eternal. It, it never had a beginning. It will never have an end. When we are unaware of that love, when that love hasn't, our heart hasn't opened, or we haven't become aware of the presence of that love in our heart, we feel, oh, I don't have any love. Or I say, I don't know whether God loves me. So the experience of that love is not the beginning of that love. Or my, if at some point I feel God has abandoned me, that doesn't mean God has stopped loving me. It just means that some other obstacle has come by which I'm not able to feel it. Or some obstacle is there because of which I'm not able to feel that I, my love for God or God's love for me. So avichinnam, unbroken. Unbroken means it is eternal. It, it, is, it never had a beginning, never have an end. What has a beginning is my opening of the heart to become aware of that love. Sukshmataram, all experiences are, are subtle. Like this, you see, 
uh, for instance, if you now, well, let's, let's stick to that ice cream. So the, the ice cream that you see in front, it's, it's, it's tangible. It's something you can see. The joy that you get as a result of eating that ice cream, that's subtle. That's something that you can experience. Nobody else can see it the way you experience it. Now, this experience of love for God is even more subtle more subtle than any of the experiences we have in this world. And anubhava rupam, it's something that is only to be, that's only inner experience. So these are the characteristics of bhakti. Um, we, 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 will, we will stop here today uh, and then continue with the discussion next week. So these four verses that we saw today, um, giving the characteristics of love, that it is beyond description. It is something like, uh, like a person who has experienced something but is not able to express it. Um, although it is ineffable, inexpressible, it does manifest itself in some places and in some people. And finally, this love is, is guna rahitam, is beyond gunas, it is beyond desires, it is continually increasing every moment. It is unbroken. It is subtler than the subtlest. And it is an inner experience. So these are some of the characteristics of love that we saw today. So if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, feel free to, to share. Swamiji, can you, uh, can you have love for God uh, in deep sleep? What do you think? I mean, I don't, I don't think you exist in deep sleep. Well, you exist, but, but you, you, don't, you don't, you're not aware of your separate existence. You don't disappear in deep sleep. You are there, but you are not, you are not thinking of yourself as, as an individual. Yeah. So, I mean, what difference would it make if I say yes or no? <laughs> That's a good question. So I guess a better question would be, when you said it's such a subtle, it's the most subtlest form, um, things that are subtle often are also fleeting. So how is it that this is subtle, yet it's continuous through your, your existence? How do you... Say, say that again? So, so most things when we think of as being very subtle, at least I associate those with being temporary. They've... They're subtle, I can feel them. But On yet... the other hand, things which are subtle are more lasting than things which are gross. Your, your hardware and software, for instance. The software is subtle compared to the hardware, and which, which really has a longer, longer life than your hardware, right? So I think things which are subtle are generally long, longer lasting. The mind, the mind is more subtle compared to the body. And the mind outlasts death. So, so it is longer. And this is subtler than the subtlest. So, yeah. uh, well, with the definition of love for God, I think, is, is it possible, is, it is impossible to have love with any other individual? Because it is, if you t look at the world, we always talk about love, and it is whole world is of love. So there is no true love exists between uh, two individuals. No, there is. The love that exists is very real, but the way that love is understood and interpreted, that the understanding of that love, it, it may not be completely accurate. Which is what really the way there is a verse in the in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, um, um, which says that if one person loves another, um, that person loves another because of the presence of the divine in that person's heart. But we may not, because we are not aware of the presence of the divine in our own heart, you know, what we are really seeing is, is this human being. So our understanding of that love is it is just one human being loving another human being. But the, the Upanishad says, it's really the source of love in my heart 
finds that source of love in your heart. And so this connection between two people is really that love connecting them. But the understanding of that love or, or interpretation of who is loving and why, there is, there is a problem with that. So the experience is true, but the interpretation of that experience it may not be accurate. So even when a mother's love for a baby, that love is not false, that love is very real. But a mother sees the baby, this is my baby, and a baby might say, this is my mother. So and the mother might think, I love this baby because this is my baby. But the, what the text says is that love is real because there is this center, this source of love in the mother's heart and a source of love in the baby heart. And those get connected, and that's why love exists. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I think, but eventually my question was, if we love somebody, how can we like fight with them or have bad feelings about them, even though we internally know that we love that person? So is it because of the maya or ego? No, good question. So human relationships are a bit more complicated than simply the presence of love. Um, what often exists is the combination of both love and attachment. And attachment, sometimes attachment itself gets mistaken for love. So what causes all the difficulties in relationships is not the love itself. What causes all these difficulties uh, is attachment. And so if there can be a love without any attachment, that would be the purest form of love. And that love can only bring joy. That love will not bring any of the other negativities we normally associate with, with love, in human love. And so when God loves us, there is no attachment there. Or when these great avatars and, and saints and incarnation, they love, there is no attachment. And therefore their love is, is uh, is free from all these other things that we experience in our daily lives. So, yes, so it's a combination of love and attachment. And it, when, it's not always easy to know in what proportion they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anish. Yeah, Swamiji, so this is our last verse, uh, 54. It, it, it makes me think that, um, you know, so, so the God is thought of as Satchitananda, and so um, it seems like with this bhakti, you're, you're trying to access the ananda portion, you know, aspect of God and have a relationship with um, God in such a way that you manifest that ananda portion, whereas if you're a jnani yogi, then it's basically more a focusing on maybe the other aspects of God, either like the chit aspect or the or the existence aspect, satra chit aspect. But this is really trying to pull out, you know, as much as possible the ananda aspect. That's what bhakti. That's what it sounds like from this, especially the last verse, is trying to pull out the ananda aspect of God. Yes, the there is a there is a there is a portion in the Chandogya Upanishad which goes something like this. It goes. Uh, Na alpe sukham asti, bhumai va sukham. What it means is, there is no real joy in the finite. The real bliss or ananda can come only from the infinite. And because God is perceived to be infinite, the love of God is limitless. Now, it's the same love. It's not like that's a different love and the love that we experience in our daily lives is a different love. Love is love. But then that same infinite love kind of gets um, channeled through this very limited personality to another limited personality. Uh, it's, no more, it's no more infinite. It's already become finite. And so therefore the intensity of joy that we can experience in any relationship will always be much less 
then the intensity of love, intensity of joy experienced with God, because God is infinite. And so that, that limitedness of all other loves makes them much less in uh, intensity, as far as intensity of joy, joy is concerned. Yeah. And often, therefore, therefore, even to experience love of God in as fully as possible, there has to be a little bit of a reduction of the ego. Because if, if my ego is, that is the egoistic people, they can make show of love for God, but it's very difficult. There has to be a little bit of a reduction, some loosening of the ego, in order for my, the door of my heart to open. Uh, otherwise, it's not possible. Yeah. yeah. Rajdi? Yeah. <clears throat> So I mean, it seems that uh, just from the, the point of view of practicing that, you know, uh, that there's a lot of fluctuation in the love. At least that's the it, way it feels. Although, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the sutras that you did today, uh, it seems like the love for God is unbroken. And it looks like the obstacles maybe come in the way that it seems that as if the love is fluctuating, but it's not that love that fluctuates. It's no. The, the fluctuation is in the mind. It's not just love, really. Everything gets Everything in life is fluctuating. Because whether you are thinking in terms of um, even reasoning or logic or love, you know, no matter which yoga you are uh, you are thinking about, um, all of this is being routed through the body and mind, and both of these are are always fluctuating. Some days you feel great, some days you don't feel great. Sometimes the mind is very alert, sometimes the mind is not, because all of these are again subject to the three gunas. So the fluctuations in the mind seem to reflect on the experience of that love. Love itself is constant. Yeah. So what Nartha is describing is a high state of uh, experience where you experience the unbroken love of God continuously? Is? It's a high state of experience, essentially. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the higher state of experience would be to experience that love as it is, unimpeded by the limitations of my own body and mind. And that is why Sri Ramakrishna says that um, it's in the pure heart or the pure mind that that love manifests itself in fully. And a pure heart, or pure heart, or a pure mind means that which is which fluctuations have almost become less. I mean, almost become zero. It's then that then that reflection of God's presence or God's glory or whichever way you express it is 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 uh, is very clear. As long as the mind is fluctuating and disturbed, and with all our other desires, the mind is not very clear either. Therefore, therefore, the experience itself is is uh, affected. Yeah. Ashish, I had the exact same question, Swamiji, that tries to pass. But uh, so, why does he use the word unbroken then? Hmm? Why does Narada use the word unbroken in our experience? That is, that is. Love is unbroken. Love, it's not like, because sometimes sometime we do, people do think, God doesn't love me anymore. So we just feel like love is something that comes and goes. And what he's really saying is, once you experience that love, you will know that it's been always there. It never disappears. So the fluctuation that seems to occur is, is, in, the, is, in, the, is in the mind the projector, not in the film itself. That's the idea. Yeah. You just mentioned about the mind. <coughs> so how does a bhakti yoga, a yogi overcomes uh, that when you have a jnana yogi who meditates and overcomes his mind and reaches the God? Mm -hmm. So what is the difference in terms of how one, both of them reach to yes, the... Yes, good, good question. See, in any act of prayer, worship, or meditation, there are really these two, two poles. One is the seeker, the meditator, or the one who is praying, or the devotee. On the other side is God. And again, a, a, a person on the path of knowledge might say that's the supreme being, or Brahman, or spirit. But there are always these two. The the initial apparent difference between the path of love and path of knowledge might be 
the focus, focus in the path of bhakti is on the other pole, the one I'm praying to, the one I'm worshiping, the one I'm meditating on. That's why a bhakta is thinking all about, always about the Lord. God is like this, God is, and so on. So there is, that is where the focus is on. In the path of knowledge, the focus is more on the self. Well, who is the one who is praying or worshiping or meditating? So a bhakta ultimately, with that pursuit of that other pole of, in this relationship, will discover the true nature of God, of who God really is experiencing God as God truly is. In the path of knowledge, the person will experience who I am as I really am. And then, of course, then these different philosophical schools come in and then say, God as God really is and I as I really am, how are they related? And the dualistic schools might say, well, he is the master, I am the servant. He is the creator, I am the creature. And then there are all these other, uh, that God is the whole, I am a part of that whole. And the non-dualistic schools will say, well, the reality of God, when I experience God as God is, and the experience of me as I truly am, so the spirit here, the Atman and Brahman there, they are one and the same. So that's how the path of bhakti or the path of knowledge, although they might apparently seem to kind of be very different in the beginning, ultimately they, they are reaching really the same point. But you know, they're coming at it from a different angle. Yeah. Yeah. Swamiji, why is it said that in Kal Yug, that the path of bhakti is more favorable over other paths? Well, it feels like that. And so, I, I mean, my, my feeling about that is that in one sense, it seems to be a path in which there is the least leads to violence to one's tendencies, if you like. By that I mean, to some extent, because um, our natural tendency is to look out and comprehend the world. And what the path of knowledge is says, oh, this is not illusory, this doesn't have any independent existence of its own, just go inside, which kind of can be intellectually stimulating, but it really is, as the Gita also points in one place, it's a it seems to be a path not all, all are, are ready for. Relatively speaking, and that's an important phrase, relatively speaking, since love already exists in our heart, we know what it means to love. Uh, so this seems a little bit more uh, or less painful or more painless to just have to then divert this, change the object of my love from these perishable entities in the world to the one imperishable being. In that sense, it is said to be easier. Having said that, I want to qualify everything that I have said up to this point by saying that <coughs> mm, easy and difficult are, I think, rel uh, are relative terms. I think a person who is A person who's, who resonates with the path of bhakti, for that person, bhakti would seem to be very easy. And the path of knowledge might seem to be, oh, this philosophy is this just too much intellectualism, doesn't make any sense to me. But there'll be some other people who, who, in whom that um, the, the cognitive aspect of the mind, the cognitive function of the mind is more developed or more open than this affective, the, the feelings and emotions in the heart. To such a person, that path would seem like, well, this, and I've seen people who say, this jnana yoga makes complete sense to me. I don't understand this bhakti. And then there are other people who are, who, whose, whose willpower is very strong. And as they apply that willpower in the world and through the work they do, 
for them karma yoga seems to be the easiest path. And there are others who are contemplative by nature, who apply that same willpower to understand the functioning of the mind within. For them, Raja Yoga seems to be better. So I think if we are fit for a certain yoga, and if it resonates with us, that is going to appear as easy to us, and the others might appear difficult. So I think this easy and difficult is, is to make an objective assessment is rather difficult, I think. It's will going to be very subjective. Swamiji, is this two kind of love, like heart is also spiritual heart and spiritual love, because the love I am struggling with, that we, now I'm trying to understand what is actually love is, because the love means uh, we, I understood before that you expect something. That's how, you know, like uh, Shrikan said that we fight, we, we think, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of expectation is there. And we define our love. If you do this, then I love you. But the spiritual love, what I now I understand from you, that there's uh, love for love's sake. Mm -hmm. Because I, we don't see, I don't see the result in material way, but I feel the satisfaction. So is there two? Spiritual love is? No, I, I wouldn't say there are two, two loves. I would just say love really means True love really means there is no I there. The whole focus is on the object of love. <clears throat> now, if, if as, as we say in, in relationships, you think like, well, what am I getting out of it? We may call it love. But just because we call it, doesn't, it doesn't become love. And so <clears throat> if the focus is all about in any relationship, it's all about me. <clears throat> What I'm going to get out of it, I don't think that there is love. I mean, you may call it as such. It's more, and sometimes many of the, the so-called love in relationships is more very transactional. That is, um, I love you because you make me happy, and I will continue to love you so long as you make me happy. And in return, I'll make you happy. You stop your part of the agreement, and I stop mine. So it, it's very transactional. It's more, it's kind of what Swami Vivekananda called sanctified shopkeeping. And then we then try to kind of cover it up and say, oh, we love each other. But if it's love, what love does is I'm willing to suffer. If, if I truly love you, I want you to be happy. And in the process of making you happy, even if I have to suffer, I'm really happy to do it. I'm not then looking at myself. Which is why all relationships are a mixture of attachment and love. And attachment is primarily an attachment to oneself, that I want to be happy. And love is about the other person. So these are these two things. And then depending on what proportion they are in, the strength of a relationship gets determined. So we'll, we'll stop here today, and then we'll continue the discussion and meet next Wednesday. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu. On Sunday, we'll have an Easter service. Um, as usually, uh, you may not find it in the flyer. It got um, missed by uh, oversight. So next Sunday, um, it's Easter. So as usual, uh, 11 o'clock, we'll have uh, music, reflection, and, and the usual program that we have. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll continue with the study of Narada Bhakti Sutra. And Tuesday and Saturday also our Aarti and meditation will continue as usual. Let's conclude with a prayer now.
May the divine being who is the father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the great spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.